Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope everybody has had a great start to the year. And as for us here in this channel, we are starting with a bang by interviewing Purna Virji, a globally recognized content strategist who is going to be talking to us about her book and about the need for a content strategy at a time when um, brands are having a harder time to differentiate themselves on this very overcrowded landscape, digital landscape. So, hello, Purna. How are you? Thank you so much for coming on the show. Monsi, I'm delighted to be here. I'm always, always happy to grab any chance to chat with you. Oh, no, definitely. Me too. We've known each other for such a long time. It was high time I brought you into the show. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. I think wasn't it? it was Aleda who introduced us at a Brighton SEO a long time ago. And I'm so glad. And like instantly, I'm like, Monse, you are amazing. And I'm going to stalk you everywhere into being my friend. <laughs> so I'm so glad that my stalking was successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, the stalking is mutual, actually. Um, Purna has been a, a, a globally recognized person for a very long time. She's now working at um, at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. but she's been recognized uh, by different uh, by, by different institutions, and she's got now a book. So, could you tell us a bit more about your amazing journey? Of course. I mean, I think like most people who fell into digital marketing, like we just randomly fell into it. Like I started off. Uh, in journalism. So I, I did my master's in international journalism. I was convinced that I was going to go and like cover war and, and strife and be a serious journalist. And and then I realized that <laughs> I'm too comfortable. I don't want to do that. Uh, so I moved to America where I started working in television. So I worked in what we call PBS or public television here in the US where I got to produce a, a series of talk shows. And it was amazing. Um, and then I had my son who was born with some health issues. And I realized like the life of a TV uh, journalist is with, you don't know your hours. You work insanely long hours. You don't know your schedule more than a couple of weeks in advance. I'm like, this just doesn't add up. And so I crossed over to the dark side, as I thought at the time, <laughs> which was PR. And anyway, so while working, I went to this sort of uh, software as a service company and started working in their PR team. And I quickly realized that we're not very busy. And my, my best friend in London was working for AOL, which was really, really big at the time. This is early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you should do this thing called SEO. It's so cool. And I remember Dimas, Mansi, like Dimas was, God, uh, if you get the Dimas ranking, it was <laughs> awesome. So I got, she was one of the moderators on Dimas. And she's like, oh my God, that's so wow. cool. And so, <laughs> I know, it's a long, long time back. So early stages where we could keyword stuff and all kinds of stuff. Early stages, yeah. Anyways, yeah so I, I fell into SEO at the time, fell into PPC, and then worked at a whole bunch of startups, scale-ups, agency side in-house before I started speaking a lot. And then when Microsoft was putting together a new team, like, so they reached out. And so, yes, a long story short, I spent, then I went, I've worked in-house, I've worked agency side, I've worked uh, at a publisher, a search engine, <laughs> I worked at an ad publisher, now I'm on social media. So I think I've had every job <laughs> in this industry. <laughs> <laughs> Which basically means that you know how things work very well, because this is what comes with experiencing different sectors and uh, different types of work uh, within digital. Well, some days I don't think so at all. And some just <laughs> every time I think I've got it figured out, I'm like, oops, nope. So <laughs> you're always learning. I'm always learning. So, yeah. Because everything changes so quickly, it's really different to say, it's really difficult to say, well, this is going to be like this at all times, like universal truths, right? Uh, it's, yeah. difficult to, it's difficult to say this is going to be like this at all times, because tomorrow something happens with Google, for example, and then everything that we have been doing so far goes, goes out of the window and we have to relearn how, do we, how we do things. <laughs> And that was one of the things that I wanted to sort of address in my book. I'm like, things, so much seems to change so much in SEO. I remember when we were like Penguin and Panda and all of those days. Uh, oh, I love that you have it. I also have it here near me. My book, my book baby, as I call her. Um, 
I was like, what doesn't change? Because right? there's so much. If everything's changing all the time, like, what do you do as a marketer? Like, how can you set your self up for success longer term? And that was really, I tried to look at like, what doesn't change and what what has stayed the same in centuries? And that was really what I've tra- I started to dig in. I started to like test and implement an agency side with customers in-house, small companies, large companies, Microsoft, I tried to do some of it. And it, it's something stay consistent and they always work. And I'm like more of us should just focus on that to, to save our sanity a bit. <laughs> so what do you think uh, you, we need to do as marketers, SEO or businesses in general to create impactful content or high impact content? <laughs> Um, there's a few different steps, but I think at the end of the day, there's a couple of principles that still apply. One is to understand people because look, times change, platforms come and go, channels come and go. Um, but what hasn't changed is how we think, right? We may change how we communicate, but human nature is pretty much been the same since the time that we were like cave people roaming the planet, right? The first advertisement was actually a cave joy for someone trying to sell <laughs> So that, that's, you know, we surprise, you know, so certain human nature, certain traits like curiosity, all of that has stayed the same, like some of our behaviors. So A, really understanding not just how what makes people tick, but going a step above and understanding how people absorb content, how they learn, and what drives behavior change. If you can sort of understand the how to drive behavior change, then you'll be much successful as a marketer, regardless of the discipline that you're working in. The second thing is to really understand sales, right? Sales and marketing alignment is, yeah. you know, everyone just writes this as a best practice, but we really need to do it because... You know, one of the biggest misconceptions, and it really bugs me when people say this because it's not true. They're like, oh, content marketing, your job is just to educate or your job is just to entertain or you just you put out blogs or an SEO, you just get rankings. But why do you want the rankings? Why do you want to put out that content? Right. Because at the end of the day, you need to sell. You need to make some kind of money or behave or some kind of business impact even if it's non-profit even if you're trying to build brand recall you're still trying to get people to think about you differently so there's an action and if we work more closely with sales they talk to customers all the time they know what's needed to close the sale understand them understand the motivators understand what they're prioritizing to pitch understanding what will make their job easier is so 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 important to do that and if you can get sales support and backing then you as a marketer have given yourself these extra like wings you know like, well, what does red red bull right air bull gives you wings and like well sales support as a marketer gives you wings and then i would say the third one is being really strategic and being very like measurement and outcome driven because it's so easy there's a million tactics that any given time months, like you and I could go back and be like, oh, we've got this new account to work on. What could we do? We could do A, B, C, D, or E. In fact, I'm literally having this conversation right now where I'm like, okay, um, my book came out at the end of July. I've done a bunch of promotion. I'm like, what's next? Like how? There's different channels I could take. Like where, what do you prioritize? And so trying to go back to being very outcome driven and strategic and measurement focused. Mm-hmm. before you create and launch your campaigns is really key. So these are really the three things at the heart of everything. And then everything else ladders up to these. These are really, really good points. And it's the, the planning of the content before you actually deploy anything, planning anything really before you actually go to the tactical side of things, because otherwise you can't really know whether you are going to be successful or not, or whether you can sustain the success you might actually get at that moment in time. So um, what are the key elements for, um, a, for planning a strategy, a content strategy, in your opinion? So the number one thing is to start with and everyone's gonna be like start with the customer no no you start first with your company talk to salespeople. try to understand what is the highest impact opportunity that you could focus on right you could have 
any company, you could have maybe two or three things or different levels of pricing. Like even if you're an independent consultant, for example, and you're trying to pitch your services, you've got different layers of offerings. You've got different, you could do an audit, you could do a limited engagement, right? There's so much you could do. So what's most important? What do people care about? What's going to drive the most money for you? Because if you've got offering A and offering B, and if you just, if you only just did a keyword search and you just looked at what was popular, if I looked at Google Trends, for example, or yeah. trending hashtags on LinkedIn or something, it might say that, oh, AI is the buzz. And so everything that we create should now be about AI. But I'm like, is that really going to make you money? Right? How is that going to make you money? Like, go think about that. And maybe mm. it's product B that it's not as sexy or no one's talking about it, but if you could just get even 10 sales of offering B, you'd be really, really well. So I would say number one is figure out what's going to give you the most return or like what's the highest priority. Then based on that, you've now narrowed your focus, right? Then you want to narrow your focus even more by understanding your audience and what do they think about this? What are the questions they have? What are the concerns they have? What are the top objections they have when your salespeople are pitching to them? Or yeah. what are the questions they ask? Because now you know what your audience needs and wants to know. And then if you, then you have much more direction again. You see, it's like almost like a funnel where you start out really broad and then each step you sort of narrow, narrow, narrow down your focus. So then you can hone in and spend your limited time and energy and effort doing only the things that matter the most. So then you're going to think about, okay, now I know what my customer wants. Then I'm going to think about how do I differentiate myself? How do I stand out? So then I'm going to go look at the competition. How's everyone else talking about it? Uh, I gave this example in my book where there was, uh, I had a client once who ran a car dealership in, in this town in Texas. And then they were like, we've got the lowest prices in town, which sounds like a great offer, but every other car dealership was saying exactly the same, we've got the lowest know. price. So then if everyone's saying we're the lowest price, then you're not special, isn't it? And so we're like, let's just change the offer. Let's talk about, hey, we're going to give you like five free oil changes when you buy a car with us or something like that, free maintenance. And so that helps you stand out. So then look at your business, look at your customers, look at your competition. So then you know how to come at it differently. And then think about, okay, what are the outcomes? How will I measure it? What's my strategy? And then, and only after you've done all of that, should you start creating your campaign and like content and launching it out. And it sounds like a lot of work. I agree, but it is worth it. Like I have never had a time that this hasn't paid off because we, that's only 24 hours in a day, right? We still yeah. need to sleep. We still need to eat. We still need to do other things. And so there's always more that we could do than we have time to do. So if we can stack the odds in our favor, then we'll have a much better chance of getting the high impact that we, we want. I was only having this conversation yesterday um, about, about uh, the fact that we just have limited resources and by limited resources it's not just about uh, budget it's also about time and our own mm -hmm. time uh, there's 24 hours in the day and hopefully seven to eight hours of those are to be able to, to spend in bed sleeping <laughs> sleeping well so we have to make the most of our own resources i think is 101 marketing 101 differentiation but also making the most of our own resources to achieve objectives in the first place so if we are going to be creating content that says exactly the same thing as every other person, yeah, how are we going to stand out? How are we going to, hopefully we're going to be just uh, jumping the wagon. Uh, maybe we are going to be um, um, included maybe in some, in some kind of other, other people's contents uh, um, by uh, saying that we are talking about AI perhaps as well, but is it making us money? That's that's my that's my main thing. Yeah, the differentiation is key and resources is, is key as well. Something that really stands out for me in the book is what you have just mentioned about the partnership with sales. Because as marketers, SEO broad marketers, uh, we tend to kind of dread this collaboration. And in fact, the collaboration needs to be absolutely seamless. 
because otherwise it's very difficult for us to create any campaign. So do you have any any tactics, any um, anything that we should perhaps implement right now or know about collaborating with sales? What is the best way? For sure. I think the number one thing is just to set up a few calls. So if I if you only have one hour, which sometimes, you know, an hour is a lot for people to squeeze out, but this will be the best hour you spend. Let's say if you work with a client or whether you're in-house, just ask the, a sales leader for an hour of a salesperson's time or, or two or three of their best salespeople, the ones who tend to perform really well and say that, listen, I'll, I'll buy them pizza, I'll buy, you know, whatever you want. Like, let's have a lunch and learn where these are the four or five questions that I want to ask them. And then just get, you know, even if you talk to three or four, because you don't want to talk to just one, you want to get a little diverse perspectives. So talk to like four or five different people, if you can get them all in the room in the same hour and ask them all the same questions that, hey, what are you prioritizing to pitch to your customers this half? You know, if I created content on blank, our customers would really want to consume it, like fill in the blank. What do you think? What are the top questions people ask us? What are the top misconceptions they have mm. why do people want to choose us you know what are the biggest objections who else have, do they tend to look at like who are the competitors and if you just got the answers right because sales talks to prospects and customers all day long yeah we rather than us having to do this in-depth like audience research poll even if you just one hour with sales and got some of their collective thoughts you will be 10x better like every time like I do this without fail every six months at the start of every half I do I do six month plans uh, mm -hmm. at LinkedIn uh, and so I will go and reach out to my sales partners and stakeholders and I'll be like listen it's the same annoying questions that I ask you every six months but it gives me the best ideas it helps me prioritize and then they have so much faith in what I'm creating right because I listen to them like at the mm -hmm. end of the day we can bring prospects in we can address you know more of the total addressable market who may not be in the market to buy right now like we can warm up and get people leads but sales is going to close them at the end of the day right marketing is not sales sales will close so they can feel the faith that we are supporting them it makes no sense for us to work separately so i would just no. start with a one hour meeting with them ask them questions summarize the answers and then for extra bonus, so just go back to the sales leader and say that, listen, I talked to all of these people. This is what I'm hearing. These are the things that pop to me. Like, what do you feel? And so now you get, uh, you know, because leadership has a different perspective than sometimes the even like a frontline manager or so, yeah. an uh, individual yeah. contributor has. So this way you can round out and get the perspective from an individual contributor, from a frontline manager, and then from a senior leader as well. And and then they will see the value, then they'll help and they they can get some, uh, you know, sometimes I'm like, wait, you know, I would love to feature a case study or, you know, yes, I'm trying to talk about thought leadership on LinkedIn. And it's, you know, do we have examples, sales of somebody who's doing well? And then they're so excited to help me. And then they'll share some awesome examples. I'm like, oh my gosh, you helped me so much. Like, I'm so grateful to you. And, you know, the more allies that we can have, like marketing is tough, sales is tough. The more that we can help each other, I think we'll all win. I think so, because we are all, or we should be actually rowing in the same direction, right? Uh, we are all mm -hmm. uh, trying to reach uh, the same objectives in a different way. But again, at the end of the day, we are all trying to help the company to um, to, to be successful. So it's. Um, I think to me, uh, one of the biggest wins is to let them know that they are with me. They are... Um, yeah involved that they, that I am listening to them and sometimes what happens is that they tend to forget because they um they kind of close uh each other's uh, I don't know if, if I um they kind of um they don't like they tend not to like working with others because they all have their own objectives and so they tend to forget about the fact that there are parts of their jobs that they have to actually uh, collaborate with others with. So and this and this has been my experience anyway. So just having regular meetings with them, even if it is just to say, hello, how are you? How are you getting on? It's, it's just amazing. Uh, 
I mean, what what you get from that is it's just great. So many good insights, as you say. No, so I totally agree. <laughs> Something else that I'll do is I'll ask sometimes if I have a, so not for every single thing, obviously, but if I have a high value narrative that I'm creating that I know yeah. we want to use a lot, then in the draft stage, I'll ask a few trusted sales partners, like, can you just review this? Like, what would make it more impactful? Like, what, how would the, how would our customers react? What should I change? Is there a different wording? And every single time, Every single time they've pointed something out and I do this, but there's so many other people, like so many other marketers who are like, we're the marketing experts. Like we know this. I'm like, why are you letting your ego get in the way? Like, don't you want to have better results? Like to me, that's, a, that's <laughs> like, this is my list of complaints. No. But my second complaint for the day is that don't let your ego get in the way, my friends. Like look at them as your partners, advisors, the more diverse perspectives you can bring in the better and more uh, impactful it can be. And while I'm complaining, my third complaint, Mansi, is <laughs> good enough. People are like, oh, you know, I'll just get ChatGPT to write my content and I'll put it out there and then I'll rank. I'm like, oh, why are you optimizing for algorithms and not humans, right? At the end of the day, people are going to consume your content and people are going to buy from you. So if you're going to optimize for the machines, or just think that I can put out good enough for the same content that everyone else is putting out. No, it's so competitive now. People are so distracted. I mean, hey, we have the sexiest thing ever in our hands, which is our phone. And so if I'm on a, I'm listening to a podcast and then I get distracted by a ping, you've lost their attention. And so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you need to have the attention. It's too many stimuli out my there. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's, those are complaints <laughs> that I tend to even discuss with clients at times. Yeah, how to overcome this? Yeah, but um, you know what? This happens and this that and this like. Well, yeah, but we have to make sure that all the content gathers all the attention attention for the right attention span, <laughs> the right time. That's what it is, and I think. Uh, one of the things that I have loved the most from the book so far is the fact that you have paid attention to how adults learn. It really is very important. And this actually is related to uh, another conversation I have had recently with another client uh, talking about content because they thought content was videos or no. um, articles on a blog and things like that. It's like, no. Content is absolutely everything that you put on a website or a mobile application, for example, uh, um, from top navigation labels to, to yeah, long form content, perhaps. Yeah. So the way we actually consume that as adults is different from the way children consume their own content. Mm -hmm. So um, can you talk to us a little bit more about the ages model and uh, why we should actually pay attention to all those things? Absolutely. Like the way adults learn is different than how children learn. And so if you, and so I spent many years working in instructional design, like I've created training programs for customers, for salespeople, for, you know, for the likes. And it's been so fascinating to see the trends and to study this whole art of instructional design. And based on your ask, like there is this model called the ages model, which is from the neuro leadership Institute, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't create it. I love it. I follow it. I've used it. I, I believe in it a lot. And so the A stands for attention, uh, which means that, and this is obvious, but it, there's science behind it too, which is in order to learn and for something to first actually even get absorbed in your brain, you need to be paying attention to it. And the more, attention you pay, the more focused that you are on it, the much more it stays uh, in your brain, right? If I'm just skimming something through, I'm not really paying attention. I'm not really going to remember it. But if I'm really head on focused, I'm, you know, you have my full attention, your brain is actually going to start like locking it and moving it from short term yeah. to longer term memory, which is super cool. And so you want to make sure that you're grabbing attention. And by that, I don't mean clickbait because you can't no. make a promise and not live up to your promise, right? This breaks trust. It's not no. worth it. You need to build in points of time where you can hold attention. Then the G is generate. So how, the best way to learn something is to generate 
connections between new concepts to old existing concepts. So mm -hmm. if you've ever watched a show like Dragon's Den or Shark Tank in the US, so you'll hear somebody pitching a concept. They'll be like, oh, this is like the Netflix of uh, bags mm -hmm. or something or Netflix of shoes where you can just get like, oh, it's like a lending library. It's like a I don't know, that's actually a terrible example, but you know what I mean. Or this is the this is the Uber or something. So then you start to understand it. Or you'll hear people be like, oh, orange is the new black. Because, you know, like black is considered a very chic color. And so like, oh, this is the new black. Or mm -hmm. So then if you can connect new information to old information, then it's easier for people to understand. That's why we use analogies a lot. Analogies, right? like, oh, yeah. marketing, marketing is like dating. You don't ask people, you know, you wait till the third date or, you know, you want to warm up your leads, etc. The whole bucket. So that helps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, love, I love analogies. And then, okay, so E, which is in the ages. So E it stands for emotion. Okay. Now I'll ask you, Monty, and everyone uh, listening, if you... Think about your most vivid childhood memories. You don't have to share them. Chances are they are the times when your emotion was really, really heightened, right? Either I was really, really happy or I was really scared or I was really upset. Like those mm. memories are almost like locked in, right? So the more you make people feel something, they'll learn, right? So if you try to get people to have fun while learning, they'll remember more. You get, you know, that's why even in advertising, especially B2B, like we like to think that, B2B marketers are serious people and we must talk only rationally, but people are people, right? We're all no. human. So you want to feel something. So nostalgia, humor, uh, surprise, delight, like you name it, that's helpful. And then the last one, so most people do the A, the G, the E well, but most people pair with the S, which is called spacing. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, Monsi, but when I was at school, I was the notoriously last minute crammer for my tests. Because I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got a test tomorrow. <laughs> I haven't studied. I should have studied. And then last minute, I'm like cramming, cramming, cramming. I'll do my test. I'll do all right. But then I'll forget everything, right? That happens to you. It happens to a lot of people. Well, maybe you're a planner. So I feel like you were a planner. Like you were I like I know, like you're really organized. <laughs> Bad example for you. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Because sometimes it happens and you don't have enough time to do everything that you have to do. So you just leave for the last minute the stuff that you think, oh, it's going to be easier. So you start crumbing, <laughs> well, especially when you realize it wasn't as easy as you think it was. <laughs> exactly. So just a spacing learning. So, so let's say the first time you hear something, let's say you're trying to learn a new language. So like the first time, let's say I'm trying to teach you Hindi and I'll be like, to say, how are you? You say, aapke, say ho. And so now I've said this once to you, you probably won't remember it. But if I had to be like, okay, Monsi, aapke, say ho. And then if I say it two or three more times, now you'll start to remember it, right? So it's like the first time you hear information, your brain will only retain very little of it. The next time you hear it, yeah. you'll retain more. And so you want to space out learnings, so, which is why, you know, people are like, oh, I created this awesome ebook. I hit publish. My job's done. You know, build it. They will come. It doesn't. You've got to keep pushing it. You've got to keep publicizing yeah. it. Right. You see Hollywood every time they release a movie, the actor, the director, they're going on every single talk show. They're mm -hmm. doing their multiple promotion. It's just because you want people to keep hearing about it all the time for it to stick. So, so that's really ages. So it's applies to instructional design but yep. marketers can apply this too right to make us better yeah build it and they will come it used to happen a lot before the internet <laughs> era before internet became mainstream right now there are so many touch points for users and customers you just can't think that they will come to you as if they were living in the 1980s, 1970s, because it's, it's not like that. So you have to definitely like, but, you have yes, to but face even it. Then, Monty, Repeat. Sorry to cut you <laughs> off, but even then you had like radio ads and you would have those jingles and then you'd remember yes, it or you'd they. have like Nike slogan, just do it. Mm -hmm. They've had this since before the internet, but Nike, just do it, just do it. They've said this for years and years, so you remember it. And so the radio would try to come up with something catchy, even newspaper print, they put things in there. So we did this, this spacing, this repetition. It's been done for hundreds of years. Yeah. The internet's just so a new way to communicate, but what we need as humans hasn't changed. You see, so that's a really good example. 
Yeah, definitely. Things have not changed really that much. It's just that there are new channels and we need to learn how to yeah. communicate through those channels. But the basics are still there. And it, it still, I, th I think I, I think it was Gianluca Fiorelli. I had this conversation with, with him, the video. Love Gianluca. And, and we were talking exactly the same thing. Things have not changed that much that much things seems to come back all the time so new people people who have left experience less experience within marketing within seo will actually think oh this is something that is not that, that this is just it's new um i'll give you an example that i find myself very very interesting this is not technical seo this is a swot analysis mm -hmm. uh it was really interesting i think it was last year uh, fairly recently, I started hearing again about SWOT analysis. Uh, but SWOT analysis in SEO, as if it was something new, and it's like, mm, I've always done SWOT analysis. <laughs> it's so <laughs> useful because it's like a kind of mapping ideas in your head almost. It's not just about presenting it to your clients or to your colleagues or something. It's also about helping you out to, uh, uh, you know, to generate content, perhaps to generate ideas for content too. <laughs> Or at least I have used it for that. Too. Yeah. No, you're so right. That's so true. And I bet, like, I'm sure this will give you a laugh. But now there's people talking about doing SEO on TikTok. And then they're like, oh, you should just put your keywords in the same color as the background. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, we, this was 20 plus years ago, like, early <laughs> SEO days. And uh, one of my friends, Jeff Cologne, always says that Perna, everything is a remix, right? He says this all the time. He's like, everything is a remix. It's everything cyclical. It's all the same stuff. It's just new avatars of the same stuff. So, yeah, it's so funny. Like, when you've been around long enough and not to age any of us, <laughs> no. we're super young. <laughs> it's, just, it's just the same yeah. things, basically, but just uh, wrapped up in a different type of paper. <laughs> different packaging. Exactly. Different packaging, yeah. So yeah. In a way, it's good, right? If you go with somebody with, you know, lots of experience like you, Monsi, then they'll know. Like, you've seen... The early you've seen Yahoo, you've seen AOL, you've seen Google come and you know, how it's evolved, and so you can sort of you. That's why, like, one of the reasons why, like, you're such a well-respected SEO because like you have such a you know strong grip on the industry. No, thank you, thank, thank you so much. And now I wanted to ask you a, a little, little, little bit of a different spin-off to this. Um, how, what would you avoid? Something, I mean, in your years of experience uh, crafting great content, you will have seen something that keeps repeating or which maybe doesn't repeat too often, but creates the biggest, um, the biggest mistakes, the biggest disasters ever. <laughs> I would say the things to avoid is one, like something, this is such a small point, but it makes such a big difference in the copy is that you can have the best research, you can have everything done, but if you're writing your copy in a very like me-centric way, where it's like, you know, we believe that our customers come first, or we believe this, but I'm like, that's actually not customer-centric. It's you should be like, your needs are our top priority, like the you language versus we, and it's so easy to fall into the trap, especially when you're working like internally on something. So if I was going to talk about uh, a new LinkedIn product, like I have to be really careful to not be like, and we say this and we do that. I'm like, okay, you are looking for ways to do this, or this might help you, right? It's a small but subtle shift mm -hmm. that makes a really big difference in the content. So that's one. Uh, two is not doing your research and just skipping over. It's so easy. And I will raise my hand. I was guilty of this when I was a, you know, young marketer many years ago. And just I'm like, well, I know what's working. Like, I know my industry. Like, I'll just put it out there. Let's test some things and see what works. Mm. And that will always be testing. No, like, Testing has an opportunity yeah. cost always, right? Like you're mis gonna give up some things. And so you should really put, take the discipline, give that one week or two weeks to, even if it's like two months of research, it's worth it, it because is. then you're setting the odds always in your favor. You'll be much more in the right direction. So just, you know, do that. So like, don't just think, don't throw spaghetti at the, at the wall and see what sticks to what else? Let me give you a third one because I like rules of three. Is just don't prioritize algorithms over humans. Like so often people are like, oh, oh, yes. oh, oh yes. you know, 
content is just for SEO or content is just this. And I'll just get this AI to, you know, I'll create like 800 articles and put it out there and I'm sorted and my rankings will come. It's like, no, some of these things will may work short term. You'll get this artificial boost, but no one's going to, somebody has to click. Somebody has to decide they want to buy. And so what's the, you know, think about your brand at the end of the day. Like, do you want to be known for like hollow, untrustworthy content? Or even if it's decent, good enough content, like, is that what you want to be known for? Do you want to be exceptional? And the companies that win and survive long-term are the ones that are provide exceptional experiences so that's the third one experiences definitely so you don't want any artificial intelligence tool to pick up bad content that is associated to your brand uh definitely not uh, but um... yeah but use ai i'm not saying don't use ai right no, no, I have been, you know me i've been talking about like voice search and ai and like you know how you know search ends because since like 2016 and 17 like Working at Microsoft, I was so fortunate to be and see the power firsthand yeah. that I'm a big believer in the fact that AI gives us superpowers, but we can't afford to, to prioritize artificial intelligence over emotional intelligence. It's like if you take what makes us human and then if you add this layer of extra creativity and magic that AI can bring, mm. oh, you're going to win. Like You're going to do amazing, incredible things. But if you're going to use it to take some lazy shortcuts and be like, let me just churn out like 800 articles on, on this, like, you know, 50 different topics. It's, who's the end goal? I just care, care. I think if I should give, leave, leave everyone with like one piece of advice is like genuinely care about your audience, genuinely care about the people, like have this desire to want to help, empower, entertain, like engage with them. And then, you know, you won't, you won't take those bad shortcuts. You'll want to add value for them definitely so this is the best way for you to to add artificial intelligence tools um is there any other advice that you would give because i normally use them to help me with uh, maybe just uh, generating codes uh, schema code or generate content ideas rather than full texts because <laughs> i've seen them and i've seen them and they look correct but there's not the kind of things that i would publish because if they just were lacking that bit that actually would make them more coming from a human being rather than a machine and but also soul, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's all. also they use the same words delve delve into which i would use as well but not at all times delve into or certainly or things like that right it's very it's very odd sometimes when i read texts like that I mean, I love using it to generate images for my PowerPoint decks. Oh, yeah. If I'm going out images. to present for, for my books, I'll use things like that. But the best advice I could give is like, one, just remember that AI, this is the worst that AI is ever going to be. Like it's growing so fast, it's evolving, it's getting better and better every day. And so I think, yes, it's the future is really bright. It's always yeah. going to be a little bit of a bump before we hit that, right? Even with the internet, we had the dot-com bubble burst mm -hmm. before we have the internet, what it is today. And I feel like things always get worse before they get better, but have faith. Like I'm very bullish on AI. I think it's going to be awesome. Just use it like any tool, right? You can use it in the right way. Like I can mm -hmm. use the knife to finally dice my vegetables, or I can use it to like accidentally chop my finger off for cooking. So, you know, like the same tool, like use it carefully and you'll have a beautiful meal. Um, so just think, try and experiment and have fun. There's a lot of creators who actually share a lot of stuff. Like I had recently done an interview with Ross Simmons for Duda, where he talked yeah. about some cool ways that he's using AI. Andy Crestodina had been on a webinar I did with, uh, again, with Anton and the Duda team where he talked about how he's really using it for customer research. I mean, there's amazing people, right? Follow Follow them, see what they're doing, play around with it yourself. And that's the best way. And, and sometimes, Mansi, I feel like when you've done something for so long for marketing, like, it can feel very like, okay, I'm just going to go through the motions. And then once in a while, it's so fun to just remember that marketing is meant to be so much fun. Like we love what we do for a reason. So just go back and experiment with no pressure of mm -hmm. outcomes or outputs or anything. And you're just creating for the joy of creativity, for your learning, just like you did when we started learning. We were so passionate about learning when we first started. And yeah. so it gives you back some of that joy. So just, just enjoy it.
enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. That's a great, great thought to leave, uh, to leave people with. And the last bit, what do you do when you are trying to switch off from all content strategy, artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera? What do, what do you do? What, what is your biggest hobby? You know what? I found that uh, cooking sometimes is greater with the, with the family. I'll try to do something like that, or I'll try to watch a Bollywood movie. Like I love Bollywood movies and that's just my favorite thing to do to just escape into this different world. And that's a really good one or doing something completely different. Cause yeah, it's, I, I'm very type A. I'm very thinking like if I'm, I love my work as well. Yeah. I love what I do. And so if I'm, it's so easy to keep thinking about it all the time but then I find like it's not good for you like you have to rest and recharge so sometimes I'll like to uh just cook a meal from scratch uh, and just you know learn a new recipe that I haven't ever done before and so I'll do something like that in the kitchen watch a movie take my dog for a walk that's probably a really good thing to go out and and do something like that or talk to a friend and and that's good. But yeah it's important to just unplug and recharge batteries and I need to do more of it. Yeah, I think we all need to do because it's very it's very easy to kind of keep going, right? Because we all love what we do, mm -hmm. and there's so much to learn and so much to read, so much to actually find out about, and so you keep thinking about it. But I actually might pick your brains regarding foods and recipes, Indian recipes. Oh yeah, <laughs> which I love. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So thank you so much, Purna, for your time today. Uh, you've got, you've given us a lot, uh, um, a lot of food for thoughts, and I'm very grateful for that. Thank you so much. Monty, it was such a pleasure. I always love spending time with you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.